Is the Bible literal or metaphorical? Well, the Bible contains all of these literary genres, right? So it has historical narrative in it. It has poetry. It has wisdom literature, prophecies, epistles, and apocalyptic writing. Therefore, it is both literal and metaphorical. Um, so, you know, literally, the historical narratives and straightforward teachings are literal, whereas poetry, parables, apocalyptic literature uh, use language to convey a deeper spiritual truth. So, is it as important to understand a spiritual truth as it is to understand an historical event? Absolutely. You really shouldn't have one and not the other. You really mm -hmm. should have both. And that's why they're both present in, in the Bible. Yeah. So you, the goal is to try to find, is to read each type of genre according to its purpose. What is the content? What is its intended message? Um, and that's the way I would approach it. Well, welcome back, everybody, and welcome to our podcast, Journey with Jesus, where Jeremiah and I talk about all things related to Jesus and his journey. And in this series, which is called Faith Questions, we're reviewing and discussing questions that we've seen on the internet, popular questions about um, faith, about the Christian faith in particular. And we've already covered a lot of ground talking about Jesus, talking about God, talking about the Holy Spirit. So I would encourage you to listen to those podcasts because there's some great information in there. And today we wrap up the series talking about the Bible. And <clears throat> You know, I'm a Bible scholar, a Bible nerd. I actually have a t-shirt that says Bible nerd that Rich <laughs> gave me. <laughs> and so I love this subject. I could spend a lot of time talking about it. Uh, and I'm excited that we are talking about it. Um, I guess a question that I might have for you, Jeremiah, right off the bat is, uh, do you remember your first Bible or the first time you got into the Bible as a follower of Christ? Man, that's a that? great question. You did not prep me on that question. And yes, <laughs> I absolutely do. Uh, it just, you know, a wave of memory came back to me. It was a Bible that, um, uh, there's always Bibles in our house, right? But there, the Bible is mine. It was sometime in early elementary school. I couldn't tell you. It's like, it's, it's, a, it's one of those foggy kid memories, but it was yeah. a white Bible and it had Jesus holding a lamb on the front because it had some pictures and things in it. And it was, <laughs> nice. you know, gold, uh, leafing, the edging, I don't know that was gold. Edging yeah. was like uh -huh. NIV student or kid, no kids Bible. <laughs> right. I had that until probably middle school. And then, uh, I had a student Bible, right. That was a little bit more, um, uh, louder cover for the nineties. Cause we liked, you know, that kind of stuff. <laughs> Then. edgy uh, but, making it a little more fun right yeah. right and then you know in high school it's like you start to get in at least the the way my journey went you start to get in like what's the best translation right so then you might get this other one and this other one and you read it and then uh, I was exposed very heavily to King James for just a short snippet I went to a, um, a Pentecostal Christian school and that was King James or bust right there was nothing oh, wow. else there but like, ew, they were all hardcore <laughs> gene. and like the principal like phenomenal memory and the dude just like could quote King James scripture but you're also like you know as a sixth grader you're like why are all these these and thous in there it's kind of interesting so you just opened up a can of worms yes I remember my first bible what about you Sandy I do remember my first bible because I was raised catholic so we always had a catholic bible around the house and it was one of those big bigger family catholic bibles which I think you were supposed to make an heirloom and pass it down um, from generation to generation. Kind of the same thing. It had the gold paper edges. It had a lot of illustrations in it. But I don't think I 
I bought my own Bible until I was an adult and mm -hmm. became a Protestant, became a Presbyterian, and then I purchased my own Bible, which was kind of a surprising thing to me to see the differences between the Bible that I had and the family Bible. Mm. Um, and we are going to talk about the differences between the denominations and the Bibles. But yeah, I've had a Bible in my house, in my life now for decades. And the truth is that the Bible is in many people's homes, that mm -hmm. many people have a Bible in their home, more than one. And the question is, what's it going to take for you to get it out of the shelves and to start reading it? Like, what's it going to take to make it a part of your habit to learn more about the Bible? Because I think that is the surefired way to learn more about Jesus and to enrich your faith. So I got a great answer for you to start a podcast, right? You'll be reading the thing a lot. <laughs> Right, or go to graduate school, and then you read that thing a lot. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's, there's Somehow, easy, two you have easy to paths. Get... <laughs> yeah, you're right. Well, e totally easy. Um... Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. All right. So, so we have I guess our we should... yeah yeah we have a question to start off with. Yeah, because we've been right. talking about the Bible. Like everybody knows what this thing is, and yeah. it's one of those things in culture that we all kind of know, but do we really know? Right, like it's all talked about, but what is our experience with this? So let's just go back to the 101 level stuff. Sandy, what is the Bible? The Bible uh, is a sacred scripture. It's the sacred scripture of Christianity. And every faith has its sacred writings. We mm -hmm. all know that, and this is our sacred writings. It's really a collection of texts that Christians believe, and I believe, are divinely given, given to us by God. Um, and in the Bible, in the book of the Bible, it is revealed to us God's relationship with humanity. Um, it has teachings in it, history, poetry, prophecy, wisdom, and moral guidance. It's so full of different and important, valuable information. Um, in the Christian Bible, this book is divided into two main sections. Most people know that. There is the Old Testament, which aligns closely with the Hebrew scriptures, everything that happened in the Hebrew uh, environment and the Jewish faith, and the New Testament, which focuses on the life and teachings, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Uh, in the early Christian church. Now, you know, the truth is that the last book of the Bible, or the Bible was put together as we know it, the canon as we know it now, um, I don't know, in the fourth century AD. So this is a book that is now 1600 years old, 1700 years old, and people often wondered, you know, why does it have relevance to us today? I've heard it referred to as a dusty old tome, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which really just implies that you should never take it out of your bookshelf. Um, but the fact is that the Bible is the most widely read book in the world. Can you believe that? 80 to 100 million Bibles are sold and distributed every year. Um, and perhaps more importantly, it is the most attested uh, writing ever. And what do I mean by attested? I mean that there is clear evidence of Bible writings for the past 2,500 years. Clear evidence. Uh, so let me give you a few examples. Uh, there are more than 5,800 New Testament manuscripts in Greek written as early as the second century AD. So there are either complete works of the New Testament or pieces and parts of the New Testament. In fact, the first one that we know of is a small piece of papyrus, very small, that was dated from 125 AD, and it contains a very small fragment from the Gospel of John. So 
that's how far back we have information about the New Testament, and that's how many versions, not versions, I don't want to say that, but writings from the New Testament that we have. I don't want to in any way try to um, add any confusion to the fact of versions. Uh, then we also have the Dead Sea Scrolls dating back to the 3rd century BC, and they contain every book of the Old Testament except for one book. And I don't know if you know what that book is, but it's the book of Esther. And why isn't the book of Esther in the old, um, in the Dead Sea Scrolls? And the answer to that is there's no reference to Yahweh in it. So they didn't consider it to be a sacred, and so they didn't mm. copy it into their scrolls. Um, and there are hundreds of these scrolls, thousands of fragments. So there is no other book that exists, does not exist, that has as many references and uh, artifacts related to it as the Bible. Um, and that's saying something, that's saying a lot, in my opinion. Absolutely. Yeah, there's, it's interesting to me how the conversations flare up between the Bible or any other book from antiqu antiquity, right? Like, uh, I am uh, decided I wanted to read the Iliad, so I'm going through that right yeah. now, right? And I believe the Iliad has like five uh, references, and it was written in 800 BC is when the stories came from. And the Bible, like you said, there's thousands of references of, of competing manuscripts or... or, or um, not, not, competing. not competing, but... But uh, oh. manuscripts that, that, that are different places that contain the same or similar information, right? Um, uh, the only discrepancy would be like, hey, this person copied this thing slightly differently, right? Because there wasn't copy and paste back then, turns out. Um, and you wouldn't say anybody doubting the authenticity of the Iliad, right? And as a book, as a book that survived the ages or of its value to culture. And... The Bible is leaps and bounds ahead of where the Iliad is and all of those um, attributions and what it's done for culture. Well, not to mention that the Iliad and the Odyssey are both mythology, whereas the sure. Bible is, you know, not mythology. So, uh, you know, it's taught in high schools and colleges all the time. And it's interesting that they would consider that to be of more value than even some of the historical importance and references in the Bible. Uh, but you're right, to, to your point, that people will look at that and say, that's amazing that we still have that. Um, but they, they just disregard how widely um, distributed the Bible has been, how widely distributed the texts have been, uh, how... People still today read it, 80 to 90 million Bibles this year still being purchased. No book even comes close. And I might say probably no book should even come close mm -hmm. to the importance of the Bible, for sure. So, um, recap, uh, Bible is, uh, uh, we found historical documents, we've pulled these together. The Old Testament existed pretty cohesively outside of one book which was esther um and then the new testament we've uh compiled these letters through a canonization process and now we have the bible that's been in its format for 1600 years or so it's kind of like that yeah you have <laughs> in terms of the history of how it was put together of course you have an entire history where it was oral tradition and then the Old Testament started to become a written document during, obviously, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And then after that, um, for centuries, the Old Testament was put together, even as late as the 7th, 8th century AD. Um, the New Testament, on the other hand, um, of course, begins with writings or oral tradition again, but writing it down as early as the fourth century, I'm sorry, 40 AD. So you have writings from eyewitnesses and various people involved in Jesus's ministry very early on. All of it is written in the New Testament within the first century. And those are then canonized, as you said, a word meaning that they were um, decided to be um, 
included in the sacred scripture of the New Testament. And that happened pretty much the final list was considered and agreed upon by the fourth century. And from that point forward, it became what is uh, the 66 books of the New Testament. So we have three different Bibles, if you will, in circulation today. The first is the Protestant Bible. That's the Bible that I use. It is, um, oh, sorry, I, I, I said the, num the number incorrectly. There are 66 books in the Bible and only 27 are the New Testament. So just to clarify that, 66 books in total, 39 in the Old Testament, and 27 in the New Testament. So there is the Catholic Bible, which is 73 books, so a few more, because they include books um, and writings, extended parts of writings that are in the Old Testament only. And then there's the Eastern Orthodox Bi Bible, uh, which contains even more books, and it contains, again, more books specifically in the Old Testament. So, you know, we just recognize that these variations or versions stem from the canonical tradition, what was included in the canon, what wasn't. Um, and that's why since that period of time, they have all stayed the same. Now, what got included in the canon in the New Testament, for example, was determined by several really important scholarly endeavors to figure out what information, what writings were accurate and correct. It wasn't like they just made a random decision, let's include these and not include that. So a lot of times when you see people talking about extra books, like the Gospel of Thomas, they were not included because they don't have the same validity as the books that are included. Does that make sense? Absolutely. What would you yeah. say to a person that wanted to read like the Gospel of Thomas? I would say that scholars will use that content to look at, uh, to try to glean information about the culture, look mm -hmm. at the context of it, and, because it was written in the second century. Uh, there's probably some valuable information in there culturally, but it's not related to the life of Jesus. The only books in the New Testament that are in there are eyewitness accounts or first generation authors. So okay. when you get into the second generation author or third generation author, they clearly don't have the credibility that was required to be in the New Testament. So, so we should feel about assured. Authors. Yeah. And that, that tees up our third question oh. uh, uh, very, uh, quite well of who actually wrote the Bible. <laughs> Many people wrote the Bible. Four, 40 people wrote the Bible. 40 different people uh, wrote it over approximately 1,500 years. Um, these authors were inspired by the Holy Spirit to convey God's message. So you have human authors, but what was written was conveyed by the Holy Spirit to the human author to write down. And these human authors are an amazing group of men and women who are prophets, they are kings, um, they're apostles, and they're other leaders. And we can point out a few in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. In the Old Testament, we Don't have forget the best Moses. Uh, Moses? Um, no. The best one. Who has the best You'll name? To, uh, oh, Jeremiah. Mm -hmm, yeah, mm -hmm. okay, okay, yeah, okay. We can throw him in there. Yeah, Jeremiah's in there, right. So mm -hmm. Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. And then from there, you have David, who wrote King David, who contributed a significant amount to the Old Testament, as did Solomon. And then you have the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and many others who contributed to the Old Testament. I think Jeremiah means tears. Does it mean something related to tears? Oh, gosh. I heard a few different things. I'm drawing a yeah. blank on it right now. Okay. It's, it's, All right. It's, I know that his life wasn't a life that most of us would choose. Yeah, well, I think all the prophets 
definitely had their challenges. <laughs> yeah. Now, the New Testament authors include the apostles, uh, Matthew and John. Uh, it also includes Paul and Peter. Uh, and then there's early companions of these apostles and other church founders, such as Mark and Luke. And the New Testament is actually written by a much smaller group of people than the Old Testament. Again, because it's capturing a smaller period of time, a hundred or so years, whereas the Old Testament is capturing hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, a couple thousands, I don't know, 3,000, I should know the number, but it's many more years. So, so um, again, while we have all these different texts being written down, being conveyed, how they were conveyed, over a long period of time, it is important to realize that Christians believe that ultimately the writings come, the lessons come, the messages come directly from God, and they have value that is beyond what we see written down, beyond that, because it's to guide our life with God, and that's incredibly valuable. So we know the Bible, uh, leading us to our fourth question, the Bible isn't constructed how most books are constructed. Yeah, tell how us how it's constructed. Give us a little insight um, into that. Well, it's multiple books that aren't necessarily yeah. linked together the way that chapters in a normal narrative book that we would read are, right? Yes. So uh, that can be a little interesting. Of How do we go about reading the Bible? This really is... An important question it's the big question because people become quickly overwhelmed when they decide that they're going to read the Bible and they open it up on page one and they start in Genesis and they're like oh well this is interesting there's some fascinating narratives in here there's some great historical content and you know that continues on um, until they get into some of the harder books like uh, Leviticus and Deuteronomy, and they're like, this is crazy. I don't know how I'm supposed to interpret or read this. And so it does create a problem. And even people who go through a year in the Bible will find a struggle in certain books of the Old Testament. And really, I'm just circling back to your comment about it's not written in the way that we're used to. It's not compiled mm -hmm. in the way that we're used to. We would prefer it to be... A historical narrative document that starts at day one and ends with the resurrection of Jesus with revelation thrown in there about what's going to happen next. But it's not that way. Mm -hmm. And so we have to figure out how to navigate it. And I think it's worth the effort. Um, you know, like, let's say you've decided, okay, I, I'm going to read this book just so that I can understand to begin with the story of Jesus. And if you ask me that question, I would say start with the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Understand that they tell the story of Jesus, but with nuances and slightly different. Which of those four books, by the way, is, one, is your favorite Gospel? Oh, I have not thought about that. I mean, if I remember correctly, Matthew has the most descriptive nativity, like birth of Christ. And I love yeah. that story yeah. and all the pieces to it. Uh, I also like Matthew's style is pretty factual, right? As you can tell, he's a lawyer or that mind. It's just the beats are pretty clean, right? Here, here it is. Here's the information. So I think it speaks to your point that you laid out we i want this thing that's just like <clears throat> here's the beginning here's mm -hmm. the end and and get me through that and matthew does that pretty well well matthew um is speaking to a jewish audience written for a jewish audience he's very focused on demonstrating how jesus fulfilled the prophecies from the old testament and he actually writes his book in a style that's based on five great discourses Okay. Um, Luke actually writes a little bit more to the let's just lay it all down as it happened type of way. Uh, Marx is a bit more succinct, kind of clean and easy to follow, and John's is distinctly, distinctly different. 
um, than the first three. So, yeah. What that's about you? Good, What's your favorite? Well, I would say I'm very drawn to both Luke and John. Okay. Um, I like Luke for his historical narrative because from the book of Luke, we go into the book of Acts and Luke actually captures the first three decades of the early church, which, which is an amazing thing to actually have that history. I like John's because his language is different and he's really focusing on from a spiritual perspective these great truths about Jesus Christ. And so I think together they give you a good feel for Jesus. Um, and then after you've gone through the, the Gospels, you really should read the rest of the books in the New Testament because I think they show uh, more of the heart of Jesus. It explains to us more information about Jesus. It shows how people, early Christians, were trying to figure out how to be Christians and what did it mean to be a Christian. Um, and that's incredibly important to understand how those teachings of Jesus were interpreted by other great um, heroes of the faith like Peter and, and Paul and um, gosh, so many. Um, James, I mean, there's just so many people that are contributing to the that effort to try to get us to understand further what Jesus wanted us to know. So that's what I would say if you're looking for that type of message. If you want to understand more about the story of creation and God, then you have to start at the beginning and you have to read Genesis and Exodus. Uh, if you want to understand Israel's long history, then you have to read all of the Old Testament. <laughs> all of it. Uh, there's historical narratives, there's the wisdom literature, which, by the way, people love, the Psalms and the Proverbs, right? Mm -hmm. um, and then the major prophets, which is frequently where people get confused. Um, so there's no doubt there's more than one way to approach it. I think a lot of people like a Bible app, Bible in a year. I don't know how would you approach it or what application do you like to use. I'm less of a Bible app person, but I know they're quite they're quite handy. Yeah, there's uh, typically how I'll get into stories. I'll think about something, and then I'll go do a bunch of research on it, like. I've for a couple of years now I've been really fascinated with the idea of um, how you judge is how you'll be judged, right? And so how do I go about in my daily life judging others? So I might go look up that scripture, right? What is saying? And then if you're in a Bible app or a website, you can very easily click through multiple translations, right? Mm -hmm. Just to see is there something being illuminated and uh, just like anything, if it's not if it wasn't written in our language, there's just there's never a direct correlation. And so there's going to be different paths to tell that story, right? Um, and, or I, another way that I'll read the Bible is there'll be some series or some, uh, uh, like a church will do, here's Genesis. Oh, okay, I'm going to go read through Genesis, you know, or like what we did in the spring of James. Okay, I'm going to read through James very linearly. And then there will be questions that will come up like, wait, why is this way? And then I'll go find that supporting information. And then again, go through the different versions, go through the different thought processes so I can understand what was happening. Because I think the any old text is immensely valuable because if it survived history, that tells you there's some value to this thing just by the process that people cared about it enough to carry through history. But um, our understanding of it's going to be different. You know, just like when I go read about something in the 1700s, the way people thought and said, it's going to be different. So I have to try to understand that moment in time and why things were said or thought about that way. Uh, I, I totally agree with that. That's contextualizing the Bible. I would encourage people that this is one of the most important things they need to do when they study the Bible is to understand the historical context, cultural, religious, historical context, because the Bible in, all, in a lot of cases cannot just be directly applied to our lives. We need to have a deeper understanding um, of 
what the message was for that generation at that time in order to discern messages that are timeless um, and apply to every generation versus those that were happening then and there as part of God's plan. And so I would say if you're going to go into a Bible study, find somebody who knows what they're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. And what does that mean? I think obviously a Bible scholar would be ideal, somebody who has the ability to bring forward um, the context of the stories. Um, that is when you get into a deeper level, really, in my mind. Like, if you really want to understand, then you need to come, you need to find sources that are going to help you do that. Don't just study it on your own, um, but study it with others so you hear different verses. I mean, I, I, I teach the Bible, I teach a Bible study constantly at my church, and I love to talk about the historical context and the characters and who was who did what who said what but I also learn from my students who have oftentimes been students of the Bible for a very long time and we're sharing information and it's a really great thing it's much better than just sitting by yourself with a cup of coffee which is also great mm -hmm. but there's a lot to be said uh, doing it with a group and I say doing it with a group at a church is awesome I would highly Literally. recommend that. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's because the nature of the book can be confusing at times. I think it's great to have people to reach out to those questions with, and those can yeah. be people that have studied the Bible for a long time, read the Bible. Just those of us among us who are just older in age. It can be a clergy. Um, and also just how awesome it is with the technology we have now. There's a thousand podcasts. There's a thousand resources out there to go and find those ideas and then go talk about them with people you care about. If that's at your church, or if that's just a cohort of friends that you might have, if that's neighbors, talk about these ideas. Cause I, um, it's, they're incredibly life-giving when you do that. And that's the fun thing about this book. Uh, some other literature, I'm not saying it's exclusive to the Bible, but the Bible seems really adapt at, if you and I talk about it, it's life-giving. Um, right. And that is, I think, when the Bible is at its best, is not only do we, under, we know it, but we know it to a point where we can talk about it and discuss it and do it with like-minded people that want to push each other to a deeper relationship with Christ. Right. We're not trying right. to take a destructive or a disassembly perspective on this thing to where there's nothing left of it. It's a use it as building blocks or a, uh, a compass to get you closer to Jesus. I, I would not be an advocate for any kind of disassembling or deconstructionism, which we've talked about um, in the past, because there's power in the Bible. And so it attracts all different types of people, some people who are believers and others who are not. Um, and so discernment about what voices you're listening to, uh, I think is important because obviously you can be led astray and many have been led astray by so-called teachers um, teaching things that are not that are not right related to the Bible. Um, and that can impede your spiritual growth. It can even change the trajectory of your journey if that happens. So, you know, hold it close to your heart in terms of the voices that you're, you're listening to when it comes to the Bible and its interpretation. Um, yes, I think you have to take up a, a, a posture of what are you wanting this, why are you diving into this thing, right? And yeah. are you diving into it because you're skeptical? you're going to find plenty of things to be skeptical about if you're finding if you're diving in into it because like i want to know and i want a deeper relationship with god christ fulfill in relationship with the holy spirit but go for it and it's there and it will lead you to it. it's not easy you know it's not like yeah, a paint by number no. story it is complicated but you have to have a network of people to help you with it so sandy we have a few questions that are coming now that are more once you dive into this book just questions that you're going to have at some point um and some of these are a little more flippant and some of them have some meat on the bone so let's start off with uh one that probably depending on your posture is really important or it's not um uh does the bible mention dinosaurs um one of those 
one of the questions, this question makes me laugh, makes me smile. Um, and also brings to mind the, the thought that people are kind of obsessed with this idea of mm -hmm. the dinosaurs and where do they fit in the creation story because they look at it as an outlier to the Bible. Like, if the Bible doesn't include dinosaurs, then by the omission, the Bible cannot be right. It must be wrong. Uh, to which I would say, the Bible does not explicitly mention dinosaurs, because that term, by the way, um, wasn't coined until the, the 19th century. So yeah, it's not in the Bible. But I do believe we all know that God's creation extends beyond what we see here on earth, and he has created beings that we know less about, for example, angels, and some other um, beings that are mentioned in the Bible. So I guess to me that points to the fact that God is capable, fully capable of creating dinosaurs, and dinosaurs uh, existed because it's part of God's plan and design. It's not an outlier that proves that God doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, you don't have to think of it as mutually exclusive. Oh, if I believe in the Bible, I can't believe in dinosaurs because that means, um, you know, the earth isn't as old or whatever. It's, it's the mm -hmm. whole new earth, young earth, old earth discussion. And I'm just dismissive of, of that by saying that's a lame reason not to believe in the Bible. Well, because I don't my believe the Bible mentions chickens either, right? Yeah, it does mention birds, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And a but it does mention like a, a bizarre thing like a Leviathan. <laughs> I mean, it's there's it's, it's it's not like everything oranges weren't included in the Bible. Clearly, they're part of our system. Now, if you want to get back to the ideas of different camps of creation and how that came to be, that's a whole different conversation, and and that's a conversation that you can have for sure, and probably should have many times in in, in your faith journey. But um, whether the dinosaurs are or aren't mentioned in the text, I don't think you can draw a conclusion from that. Uh, honestly, if, if you're singularly focused on what is a leviathan and does that mean it's a dinosaur, you're missing the bigger point. Mm -hmm. And you also don't understand who God is because if God is capable of creating the earth and the entire universe and everything in it, he's capable of creating any manner of creature. So why would you say that dinosaurs somehow represent a being that's outside of God's creation? It just, it makes zero sense to me. It's trying to focus on a way to dismiss it. For sure. And I'm not a fan of that, I would guess I would say. Absolutely. Yeah. So this next question is one that you love. As people that lived through the late 90s and early 2000s, um, this topic was oh. everywhere, <laughs> right? Uh, there was a book series to this effect, right? It was, it was, it's all over the place. Um, are there secret codes in the Bible, Sandy? Yeah, what comes to mind is um, the Dan Brown book. The no, not the not the Left Behind, the Da Vinci okay. Code. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yes. Yeah, wow. Well, because um, the Left Behind was just a taking an idea of the second coming and turning it into a Hollywood narrative, into a book idea, if you will. Mm -hmm. But the Da Vinci Code had all of this rhetoric in it about that there are secret markings, there are secret codes in the Bible that in the case of that book led to this ridiculous conclusion that Jesus was married to Mary Magdalene and they had a child which is absolutely, again, untrue. There's, abs there's no evidence for that. That's when the Bible becomes mythology. Um, and also it distracts from the Bible's primary purpose, which is to communicate God's message. I mean, God wants to use the Bible to communicate his message open and clearly to humanity. Mm -hmm. Why would he put in it all of this confusing numbers and languages in it that would make that hard to do. I mean, the, the Bible does have symbolic language in it, uh, particularly in the prophetic books, but again, 
uh, people need to interpret those symbols within a literary and historical context rather than seeking to find some hidden code that they're going to be able to uncover and somehow relay to all of humanity something that nobody's ever known about God. <laughs> I just right. think that boils down to some crazy desire to be distinct in your journey with God, which isn't always helpful. Um, some of this comes from the fact that the book, the Old Testament, was written in Hebrew. And Hebrew is a language that does not include numbers. So Hebrew is a, a language that has letters for numbers. And um, so letters represent numbers and certain words certain numbers have more or less significance to them. Even a person's name, they'll take your name and they'll make it, they'll turn it into numbers and then they'll tell you the meaning of your name. So that can be confusing to us in the West where we don't know Hebrew. And there are numbers in the Bible that seem to have significance. Um, the number three, the number seven, the number six, the number 12, and the number 40 all have theological meaning. Um, and this integration of numbers and letters can cause people to believe that, oh, there's definitely hidden codes in this language and that uh, that would then establish timelines and dates for things like, for example, the end of the, the, end of the world. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's how we got here. And again, I don't think that's God's purpose. Again, the purpose is to communicate openly and clearly, clearly, open and clearly to humanity. So why do we get all tangled up in this whole other mess of secret messages and secret codes? I don't understand it. Yeah, I mean, there's pieces of it I probably understand how some people might ladder out to get their meaning. Like you said, there's there's some numbers that appear a lot, and their context seem to be when they're communicated that it's meaningful. I, as you illuminated, there the meaning goes elsewhere than where people tend to take it. And I do think people want to. There's parts of the Bible that are just really confusing and don't lead us to a clean situation. And I think people want to grasp for a way to like, oh, this is it. This is what this all means. Or this is uh, again the certainty. I always go back to. People, humans, we want certitude. And when we're trying to reach for and grasp for loose threads in the Bible to create that for us about some of these things that there just isn't certitude, um, it's going to lead us to very interesting spots. And that would be my question for you. If you're grabbing for any thought in the Bible, where is this directing you? To or from God? To or from Christ? And if it's directing you away from it, like, do you have the right frame up? Are you, I'm not trying to diminish, uh, diminish any critical thinking, but at a certain point, having a relationship with God is faith. There's no way to scientifically prove that you should have a relationship with God. We believe there's something more and God is calling to us it's that read the Bible in such a way that it's driving you to him and not try to grasp for things that might not. Yeah, I, I, I readily acknowledge that there's language in the Bible that can be confusing for people, particularly in the prophetic books. Um, and even some of the language of Jesus can be a little bit hard to discern. But if you practice at it, and if you approach it with the mindset of, I know this has importance because it's in the Bible, and how does it further the story, the grand narrative of how Jesus um, created us and then restored us to him through Jesus Christ. If you keep that framework, then all of the pieces fit together. And I would say, having studied the Bible for a long time, that it all makes sense and it's easier to understand if you work with that framework. If you're just mm -hmm. working from a framework of, wow, let's take this outside of what it's intended for and try to make it into something that's more mythological or um, has some sort of prophecy that nobody's ever seen. I mean, that's just a waste of time and a, and a mistake. It's not what God intended for the Bible to be for. So you just brought up a point that he's up our next question really well. There are books of the Bible that like uh, the prophets. Um, and this question is, uh, is the Bible literal 
or metaphorical? Well, the Bible contains all of these literary genres, right? So it has historical narrative in it. It has poetry. It has wisdom literature, prophecies, epistles, and apocalyptic writing. Therefore, it is both literal and metaphorical. Um, so, you know, literally, the historical narratives and straightforward teachings are literal, whereas poetry, parables, apocalyptic literature uh, use language to convey a deeper spiritual truth. So, is it as important to understand a spiritual truth as it is to understand an historical event? Absolutely. You really shouldn't have one and not the other. You really mm -hmm. should have both. And that's why they're both present in, in the Bible. Yeah. So you, the goal is to try to find, is to read each type of genre according to its purpose. What is the content? What is its intended message? Um, and that's the way I would approach it. Thus, it is a bit of a harder journey than just picking up a historical novel about some other period of time. Yeah, as we talked earlier, um, how do you read the Bible? Well, the Bible is a collection of books, and therefore you have to understand each book is where it's one of, uh, it's very unique in that regard, right? Where if you were to go pick up any other book from antiquity, it fits inside maybe not any other book, but most of the pop culture ones that we would talk about today, it fits inside this genre. When you're reading this, you like you read, as we mentioned earlier, if you're reading the Iliad or Odyssey, you're reading mythology. You are, right? Mythology is not in the Bible. These are different genres, right? But there is poetry, there is wisdom, there is historical uh, conversations in the Bible. Understand that, but it is hard because it switches around as you're moving through this thing. And so you, I would say that, that it would be a mistake to read Revelation the way that you would read Luke, right? Yes, it would be a mistake to do that. Um, but there's so, certainly value in, for example, the story of Job, even though there isn't any uh, historical attesting to the fact that a man named Job ever lived. And in fact, they really don't know when that book was written or by who. But mm -hmm. that, that book on a specific level teaches us more about how to endure suffering than any other book in the Bible. And so without it, we wouldn't have answers to the question about what is suffering, what causes suffering, and what are we to do about the question of suffering. Um, so it's hugely valuable, has huge 100 value. 100% agree. Yeah, I yeah. mean, how often are you in a hard season of life and you're thinking or meditating on what's going on and does a story from Joe pop in your brain and you're like, Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, okay. I this is I can get through this, right? Yeah, um, equally true with like the Psalms and David's journey and story of what had happened to him and how he he writes this absolutely beautiful poetry that we can relate to about that we we do suffer and yet we believe. It's the combination of the two that make us distinct and really make us believers in God. So, yeah, you need every single one of those books, whether you know it or not. So mm -hmm. you could spend your entire life journey going through those books. What else are you going to do? What else? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you have time to do it. You have the time to do it. It's do you make the time to do it? Yeah, Will you make the time to do it? binge watch less TV and whatever it is that will be I mean, I'm not saying don't watch TV. I love oh, for TV. Sure. But I am saying that is there a place where the Bible uh, becomes, is there a place where you can find um, time and the ability to read the Bible and get to know it? I think you have to make the conscious decision that you're going to do that. I'm going to do it, just like mm -hmm. you do everything else. Yep. So the next question we have on our list is a little bit of an unfair question, given to what you and I already believe. Um, is the Bible true? Well, I mean, this question really, again, stems around people's thinking, I guess, about, you know, what is the Bible? What's in it? Is it true? How can it be true? Uh, how do I know it's true? It's probably 
a better question. Mm. Is the Bible true really is more about how can I know the Bible is true? Um, and there probably would be two, uh, two thought processes. One, the Bible cannot be true because it simply isn't conveying information in the way that I want it to, and it cannot be historically attested through archaeology at every single point or other historical extra-biblical books, right? Books outside mm -hmm. of the Bible that would confirm or deny what the Bible says. And then there's people who, like you and I, who believe that God exists, and therefore God gave us a way to know more about Him, which is the Bible, and so we believe it's true. I believe the Bible is true. I'm one of those people who believe that everything in the Bible is true. I don't struggle with messages around, you know, what is that actually true, or that's not me. But I do know that there's Christians that do struggle with some of it, and I think that's that's okay too. Part of the faith journey is a bit of the stri struggle. Is that not correct? For sure. If, if you look at the frame up, as, as I continue to go back to, we continue to go back to, if this book is designed to have a deeper relationship with our Creator, that's the point of this book, to help you understand uh, our Creator, understand the problem that we created with our Creator, and understand the path of redemption and how long it took us to get there. And then what lies next, it, it starts to show us. Um, if you believe that, there is not one clear path to get there. So if somebody is struggling, uh, I have a friend currently that is is really struggling with the authenticity of the New Testament because some things were kind of added and broken apart in it during the canonization process. And I think that's fine for him to have that. I'm like you, I'm not there because I feel like the story, whether you take off the sentence or remove it or add it, the story is identical to me. It's still God created us. We fell, which I feel, I feel disconnected. Uh, here is a long path through all these crazy humans. I can clearly identify with all those crazy humans. Here's Christ. I feel like I can reach out and discuss and, and pray to something greater than myself. I feel like that's possible. It aligns with the story. So all I have to say, yes, I believe that we don't have to have the same faith journey. It would be kind of bizarre if we did, um, but the Bible is, clearly a tool of people that choose to believe to grow them in their relationship with God. I, I, I'm assuming that your friend is struggling with the question of, are there mistakes in the Bible? In, it's inerrancy. More um, like, has it been, how, if and when and where has it been manip manipulated by humans to, I mean, because, you know, we've seen things in like the King James Version, the Shakespeare kind of left some stuff in there of where he you could tell his fingerprints were on it right um i think it goes back to these stories like if, if you move around little pieces on the edges it doesn't change the story um now he's a person that i think I mean, was a person of faith and has now taken a posture of probably being a little bit more uh of an atheist of like i'm open to the idea of god i'm not 100 percent convinced he's there anymore and then yeah all these other pieces get bigger in his worldview or his view of life because he's operating from a different faith perspective. Now, I'm hoping he comes back to being a proclaimed Christian. And it's interesting that he's grappling with these pieces to me. Uh, and I hope it's a pathway for him back in. Yeah, I do too. Um, it's easy to go down that rabbit hole. But the fact is, the truth is that the Bible has been... Uh, in its present form for quite a long time. When you talk about the King James Version versus uh, the NIV, this is a language issue because the King James Version was translated from Greek into Latin mm -hmm. and then from Latin into English, whereas the Protestant Bible was translated from Greek into English. So you're talking about language translations. Uh, and that can cause some, I mean, it's, it's caused the scholars who oversee the King James Version to create a, new, a newer version. Just as happens in the Protestant Version, the scholars get together and they look at word usage or recent findings or anything, and they try to improve it for the sake of clarity. 
uh, you don't see a lot of what's happening. You don't see a lot of things happen where they change an outcome of significance or theology. Mm -hmm. It tends to be very minor things. So uh, I guess I would say because of the fact that it's been the same for so many centuries, I find a lot of confidence in the scripture that what I'm reading, what I'm studying is exactly as God wants me to, what he wants me to read. Um, can you have a scribe who wrote something uh, for the 20th time and made a little mistake? Yes, but it tends to be very small things. So, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think when you get down to things like uh, textual criticism or the criticism about how it was put together, um, you're searching for a way to disavow it. And I've seen scholars uh, at the highest level of Christian scholarship do the same thing and lose their faith, I think because they were leaning that way anyway. And now they just want to mm -hmm. prove that, yeah, this isn't right. And I've come to that conclusion. Well, good for you. Millions upon millions of other people came to a different conclusion. So... Yeah, I always. I hope say, your friend finds his way back too. Yeah, I, I my always my take on on faith is let's major on the major things and minor on the minor things, right? Mm -hmm. There's if if we want to change some attributions inside Luke or however that works, like I, okay, I mean I have the conversation. It's, it's interesting, but if you're using that as a tool to deconstruct your faith, I agree with you. You're probably there already and you just found yeah. what was necessary for you to move the way that you were already moving. Um, yeah. And I, I, and I'm also, I don't want to sound super critical of these things because I think that faith isn't a straight journey, right? It, it moves you all around and you find yourself in different positions. Just like, as you mentioned earlier, Psalms, like, David's journey was not a straight journey up until his death, right? It went all over the place. Uh, I think that is because we're humans. Um, now, yeah, the fact is that, I'm sorry, I just wanted to just say that I, I'm never critical of scholars who, I would never want to criticize a person um, who spends their entire life studying the scriptures from different points of view or different angles. In fact, I admire people who are willing to do that because... It's a life that um, uh, not everybody can appreciate, that you might mm -hmm. want to spend your life studying the sacred scriptures and trying to bring additional light or shed additional information uh, for people to better understand it. In fact, I appreciate the fact that there's so much intellectual capacity being used for that. It shows that Christians don't need to be afraid of the Bible. They don't need to say, well, uh, you know, I don't know, and it's kind of a mystery, and I, you know, I, I just take it for what it is. They can say, no, no, a lot of very smart people have spent a tremendous amount of time helping us to discern and understand the Bible, and I thank God for those people who are willing to do that. That's, that's my thought about it. Yeah, I'll co-sign that statement, Sandy. We're good with okay. agreement there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Um, <laughs> now, you in some of that conversation, you illuminated there's different translations, right? We know of the big ones of NIV, King James. Um, what is the best translation to read? I'm less of a fan of the King James, um, but I personally love the ESV and the NIV, um, and everybody kind of has their own thing. Uh, as a Bible scholar, I'm interested in its accuracy to the original text. I want it to be as close to the original text as possible. So that's the ESV. Um, and also the NASB, the New American Standard Bible. Uh, they really are focused on word for word accuracy. Other people want to read the Bible they want it to be more readable. The NIV is the gold standard for that. Almost everybody has an NIV Bible in their home if they're a Protestant. Um, and people also like the New Living Translation, the NLT. Um, there's also now the message. Eugene Peterson wrote that, mm -hmm. and it's got way more of a modern language. I think younger people like it because it just it just creates the message in a more poetic sort of way. I don't want to say poetry as a genre, but just 
it stirs the heart is what i would say sure. it sounds so, right to our modern ear yeah so there's a lot of different approaches in terms of uh which one you might use i would say get a couple and if you read a passage and you're confused or stumped or you're wondering how else it might be interpreted read the other version and see if somewhere in there you find you know the meaning that speaks to you um mm -hmm. There's no reason to rely on one version all the time. Mm -hmm. and, and there's no need to because every app, right? You could go from this version to that version to this version to that. You could spend all day bouncing around looking at different versions, right? Absolutely. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost maddening at times to your point of how you can just bounce around. I mean, the answer that I would have is whatever version you like to pick up, um, yeah. Try some samples out, and whatever one helps you read, uh, get into these stories more, uh, helps you get understand what was happening at that point in time. Um, put yourself in the story. Ask yourself the questions of if I was who you know who to identify, or if I was that person, how would what is it calling out inside of me? If I was that person, what is that showing inside of me? Just like any great literature, find the one. Uh, lit, that's what the Bible does, is it tells us stories uh, to inspire a relationship with us, right? And whatever does that best, pick it up and go. But like you said, you mm -hmm. are going to hit certain points because it's not our negative tongue. It's not the world. We don't live in the world they lived in. Um, different versions can help those edges come a little clearer at times. Yeah, I mean, a study Bible is, is key. Uh, I have my study Bible, which is it's just hilariously funny because it's so, it's so, it's, I had to put a plastic bag around it because it's fake it's leather. Classy, it's classy, Pleather. pleather. <laughs> so the pieces of the pleather are falling apart off. So I'm capturing them with the bag. Um, sure, I could buy another one, but it has all my scribbles in it. And so... It has immense value to me. <laughs> I probably could find somebody to, you and to put in there. Right? <laughs> Rich is like, did you buy that? I'm like, no, it's duct tape and a Ziploc bag. I mean, it's working for me, so you I'm okay with it. You need a how-to of how to protect your Bible with Ziploc and a uh, duct tape. I'm just saying that once you find your treasure, what your Bible you treasure, you will treasure it. And I do like the study Bible because I do think that it can help to interpret things right off me, right there at the bottom of the page is interpretation of verses. And I find that to be incredibly useful. So, so yeah, find your Bible and then stick with it for a while. That's my suggestion. Yeah, I know I went through a season um, where I went really, like I went into the net Bible because uh, it has the most translator notes and all of those pieces in it. And I found myself, I got co so caught up and all that yeah. stuff i couldn't actually i wasn't consuming the story anymore right so but but step through it find what you like so we've got our closing question now sandy which is one that i don't know i don't i don't identify with this question much um so i'm hopefully you have a great answer for us <laughs> does the bible predict the end of the world the bible in revelation predicts the second coming of Jesus Christ, which would usher in a new age, specifically thought of as a new heaven and a new earth. And so it has this prophetic language um, that discusses the end times, what's going to happen. It's not just in the book of Revelation, it's also in the book of Daniel, Ezekiel, for example. And Christian scholars, once again, interpret these passages, and they kind of put it in three buckets. The first is a future view, uh, and this is probably what you are thinking about when you say I don't spend a lot of time. A lot of times people think this is something that's going to happen in the future, and that uh, these passages discuss the end of the world and the second coming of Christ, as I said. And there's the preterist view, which is others interpret it as symbolic. It's symbolic of events that have already occurred in history. So, for example, in Revelation, there's language around what was going on with the Romans in the first century AD. So it's 
already what had happened with having the Roman overlords over the Christians in the early church. And then there's this third bucket of the idealist view. Um, some people see these prophetic passages about uh, as timeless truths, and it's this timeless truth of this spiritual struggle we have between good and evil. So in Revelation, you might see it as, yeah, it's forever until Jesus comes back, struggle between good and evil. Um, I would say that the importance of this discussion is not which is the view that's going to actually happen. Has it already happened? Is it an idealism or is it something that's going to happen? Really, the message around the Bible is be prepared for the coming of Christ again, which I'm a thousand percent sure is going to happen. It mm -hmm. will happen. When will it happen? Nobody knows. And that's probably the way it should stay. Um, so God has in mind the fulfillment of history, the ultimate fulfillment of this journey from his creation uh, through the fall and then the restoration and then bringing his people to him in a place where we can live together with him for all of eternity. This is the grand narrative as we've talked about so often. So certain things will have to happen for that to happen. Do I know when? No. Does anybody know when? No. Uh, do people like to talk about it? Endlessly. A lot of oxygen in the room is taken up by it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, I might talk out of both sides of my mouth here. I go back to what you said previously of I appreciate Bible scholars, people that have made this their life work and, and dove into it. I appreciate that and I respect that and that's awesome. I'm glad those folks are there. And I also feel like this conversation gets too much airtime. Uh, and, I don't think from scholars necessarily, no. For sure. Uh, culturally I, and among certain pieces of our faith, gosh, they love this stuff. And I don't understand um, why. Uh, I mean, I guess I have theories, but it just it just seems like it, it it's I'm not saying forget it. I'm not saying ignore it, but it just it can take up a lot of word count. And I'm like, I, I don't think it's pulling us together. I don't think it's 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 to your point of um, why is this all here to draw us closer to God? I don't think it's being used in that regard. I suppose if it's used as a simple message that Jesus Christ will return I mean, I had a family member say to me recently, hey, I, I saw uh, some graffiti on a bridge and it said, Jesus Christ is coming again. And she said, what, what do you think that means? That is a conversation. Mm -hmm. And so for that person, it was a great entree to talk about that Jesus Christ will come again and that our journey here on earth is to find him and to become a part of the kingdom of God. Um, and yeah, so in that way, it, it creates this uh, expectation of a future event of which we're captured by it in our imagination. We're terrified of it. We're interested in it. We want it to happen. We don't want it to happen. It scares us. It excites us. It does create a mixture of emotions around it. And so people give it a lot of airtime. They what, like to conjecture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what people do. Yeah, it's uh, it is what it is, and I'm not gonna go plant my flag on the hill to fight it or be for it. I just, um, in my mind, it's like it's. Um, I do think it is interesting that when you go through it to put on the different caps, right? To put yeah. on the cap of, this is uh, um, talking about the Roman Empire, like. Huh? You, you put on that cap, and there's some pieces that make sense that don't make sense in a different way to me. If you put mm -hmm. on the hat of um, it's a futurist view, it's like, oh, well, okay, I can see how people can get there, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, all the camps I can understand. I think you need to spend some time in the camps to to go through it because clearly it's not um, 
it's not so concise or conclusive that one camp wins, right? But I know recently uh, the church that I attend uh, is doing a series on Revelation. Mm-hmm. And I really appreciate it. I mean, it takes... It, it's kind of going through the, the different perspectives on this thing, but it's wild as I'm reading, we're going through it at the same time as I'm going through the Iliad. And they paint, like sometimes it feels like the same type of story, right? That myth, mythological kind of wildness. But then they're talking, to, but then you understand like, oh, here's these cities that are referenced in the Iliad are the same cities that are referenced either by Paul or in Revelation. And okay, how, how am I dealing with this? It's interesting that all this is talking about all this kind of stuff. I'm not saying they're the same book. I'm just saying they have Good. <laughs> pieces that resp- that remind me of each other. So all I have to say is I am not trying to diminish the value of Revelation. I'm not trying to diminish the value of people that have studied it and try to illuminate pieces of it for us. Um, I think just the people that try to get headlines or inspire some action from people from it are probably the people I'm most frustrated with. Well, the two books, when was the Iliad supposedly written? 18... 800. 100, BC. 800. Okay, so, so it's you're talking about genres of literature, right? So mm-hmm. language mm-hmm. and how it's used to tell a story. Um, I could see where there could be some crossover, for sure. Um, but I would also say that one is for spiritual education and preparation, and the other is in intellectual exercise right mm-hmm. reading yeah. the iliad it's not a spiritual exercise it's a historical or not even it's a mythological story that that speaks to human nature would, would you say it that way that yeah, way I mean, it's a heroic anthem at the end of yeah, the day okay, and right. also it's just fascinating how people in that it's wild that somebody wrote that that long ago and ha- yeah. the pieces that still feel very modern right because people the thing that i take from that and i take from scripture that are the same is people have always been people right sure we have the same desires we have the same core beliefs i think we've always felt like there's a spiritual dimension to our lives i believe Mm -hmm. the bible has the answers for those things as where these other stories just show how people have grappled with them over time so i'm not trying to create a false equivalency i'm just more saying when you start to talk apocalyptic literature Right. Yeah, some of that feels like <laughs> I'm reading mythology. I'm not saying it is. But, right. you know, kind yeah. of put that hat on when you're reading. I'm like, okay, what are, what's happening here? What can this show me when I have this hat on? Okay. You know, um, I think a bigger challenge is people fixate on it because they're fascinated by the idea of the end of the world. And I, I would say that I would prefer that people not fixate on the end of the world and uh, hope for that and want for that. Instead, I would hope that they would appreciate the fact that God is showing tremendous restraint by not having that have already happened because he wants to build his kingdom. And the people who are alive today, he wants to give them the opportunity to become believers in Christ so that they join the kingdom. And so we should be grateful to God that he continues to do that. is the second coming of Jesus an answer to many prayers? Yes, of course, because we all want to see the fulfillment of the story, and we all want to be a part of that story, the fulfillment of it. But whether we die before that happens of natural causes or whatever cause, or whether it happens when we are alive, either way, the end of the story is that we end up living in eternity with Christ. Mm -hmm. So why wish it upon a generation when it also brings a lot of difficulties? That's my opinion, my thought. I think that's a great way to end. I think that sums it up really well. Okay, good. Well, I think we covered a lot of territory with the Bible favorite topic of mine and I really have enjoyed this series Jeremiah I think we tackled a lot of interesting fun weird wacky questions and I hope that we brought some light to them just from the Christian point of view so thank you for participating look forward to future future efforts so take care absolutely take care Cindy Uh bye-bye all right